Psalm chapter 8. The theme or the central message of this psalm is found in the first and the last verse of the psalm itself. In fact, let's bring up the last verse on the screen. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Many scholars and commentators believe that Psalm 8 comes from the early days of David's ministry. Verse 1 and 2, he, he says, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength because of your enemies, that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. David, as a young man, you know the story, a shepherd taking care of his father Jesse's sheep out on the hillside of Judea, H had lots of time alone and was able to go out on that hillside and look up into the starry sky and, well, just to see the majesty and the beauty of the heavens. We live in a time now where there's big box stores and a lot of ground lights and smog, and, and we really don't see the heavens like we used to see them. I remember one time, my, one of my first trips to uh, Haiti, uh, being able to walk out at night because they don't always have electricity, and there's very, very minimal ground lights where we go. And the stars were just amazing out there on that island. And it reminded me of this as you would look up into the sky and, and you would say, Lord, how majestic, how excellent is your name? And it's something amazing about the sky, the stars, the heavens. D David was, well, he was that son, you, you know the story, kind of overlooked by his dad when the prophet came to anoint the next king, had been sent there by the Lord, and David's out watching the sheep, and he's sort of left out. He's not even considered. He probably thought, God, what about me? All my brothers are there being examined by the priest, being examined by the prophet. Don't you care? Don't you see what's going on in my life? And sometimes we can feel that way. And yet David, he, he looks up into the sky and he goes, God, you are majestic. You're glorious. You ever have those nature moments where you've been out on the beach and uh, just watched a beautiful sunset? Or you've, you've been in, in some kind of uh, mountainous area and looked at the vistas as the mountains just seem to stretch on forever or, or stared up in a starry night? And you realize how, how great, how powerful, how, how majestic God is. David says, out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you've ordained strength, verse 2. God, even though you're powerful, even though you're majestic and the heavens declare it and I can see it, even a child can recognize how powerful and wonderful you are. This verse is saying even the simple and the ordinary can understand your greatness and see your beauty, can comprehend your, your strength. They can, a little five-year-old can realize very easily, no, no person, no man could have created this or brought this to pass or accomplished this. It's not an accident. It's not a random occurrence. The simple is what David is saying, can even recognize that there's a God and that he's powerful. It's like when Jesus made his way into Jerusalem on that final Palm Sunday, down from the Mount of Olives, down that pathway, uh, he, he comes uh, across that, that, that valley there. He, he makes his way towards the holy city, through the Kidron Valley and towards the temple, and people begin to shout. They begin to cry out, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Everyone was excited. Everyone was, you know, just amazed that the Messiah was coming into the city. Well, not, not everyone. Listen to what it says. I'll read it for you from Matthew 
21. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children, and it speaks of children crying out in the temple, and the word children there means the simple, the common, the ordinary. Hosanna to the son of David. They were indignant, and they said unto him, Do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, and he quotes Psalm 8 right here. Have you never heard or read that out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants you have perfected praise? He quotes this psalm. And and those who are seen by the religious leaders as kind of street people, as simple people, well, they're, they're offended. The people are crying out and worshiping. And they see them as, well, uneducated, uninformed. It's like what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27. It says, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. So here are these religious rulers all in their garbs and their theology and their authority and their resources. And they they look at the common people and Jesus quoting this psalm as simple and uneducated and unable to understand who the true Messiah is. Once Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, he said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the prudent and have revealed them to babes. And he's not talking about good-looking women there. He's talking about the simple, the the uninformed. Stories told about a doctor, a Ph.D. professor who was giving a lecture open to the community there at the university on why there is no God. And so people were crammed into the place and they were listening. And uh, in the crowd was about halfway back was a simple man who had come. He was a dishwasher from down the street at a restaurant, a local restaurant. Over and over again, the professor would make this statement. There is no God. There is no God. And so so finally, this dishwasher couldn't take it anymore. And he, he, he just raised his hand and he kept waving it. And the speaker's going on and on. He's trying to make his point that there is no God. And eventually he recognized this man. He said, yes, sir, you seem to have a question or what? And he stood up and he said, sir, next time you say there is no God, would you mind doing me a favor and adding to the end of that, as far as I know, there is no God. Because no one can prove there is no God. In fact, All the evidence points to just the opposite, doesn't it? That there there is a God. And what he was saying is, you're limited by your own experience and by your own knowledge. You don't know enough to say there is no God just because you have not experienced him. It's like trying to explain away, and a lot of liberal churches and people have done this, to explain away uh, miracles of Jesus. I heard one time about uh, a young boy who was in a classroom. They were studying the miracles of Jesus. And they happened to be discussing the feeding of the 5,000. And the teacher, who didn't believe in the miraculous, said, you know, what really happened was this. When the little boy brought out his lunch, it wasn't that Jesus multiplied the loaves and the fishes, But it was such an act of generosity and compassion that it caused all the other people to open up their coats and their bags and bring out their lunches, and they began to share. It was a supernatural kind of act of generosity. The little boy looked, and he thought. He said, yeah, but what about the 12 basketfuls afterwards? She said, let's move on. (laughs) God says, come to me. With humility, come to me with faith, come to me simply, come with me, come to me, Jesus said, except you come to me like a little child, you cannot enter. 
the kingdom of heaven. So David, as a youth, looks up into the heavens. And in this psalm, he says, well, listen to what he says. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens. You're great, Lord, and your glory is, is obvious. And, and tonight, I don't know if you'll be watching fireworks or, you know, seeing a display of things blowing up in the sky. And, 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 and man does a pretty good job with that sometimes. But I want you to think when you're watching them and when they kind of die out, look, look beyond that if the, the clouds are clear and recognize that greater than anything man can do or anything he can display, that God reveals his majesty and his greatness in the heavens. It even silences his enemies. They, they, they can't comprehend it. They, they don't know what to say. The, the psalm goes on, when I consider your heavens... And the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you're mindful of him and a son of man that you visit him? God, when I, when, I, when I look into the heavens and I see the silent witness of wisdom and power, the order, the symmetry, the vastness, and even today, you know, with space travel and satellites and telescopes and probes and some, listen, some 31 centuries later than David's proclamation, as you walk out on the dark night and see billions of galaxies and the order and the unity and the harmony, we're still amazed. We're still blown away. It's still incredible. The power and the wisdom that sustains it all, that keeps it orbiting in its right pathways, operating the way it does. It's, it's incredible. And David says, what is man that you're mindful of him? We're so small according to everything I see, David says. We're so powerless compared to you and what you can do and all that you've done. What is man? What, what are we, he says, that you should even consider us? And that's a question that has been asked all through the ages. When man begins to look around, when he begins to wake up a little bit, when he begins to take his eyes just off of his own self-gratification and he perhaps looks up into the heavens or sees something and he goes, wow, you know, what, what am I? Why am I here? Where did I come from? What are we doing on this planet, you know, a question that has, has been asked all through the ages, and there's basically two answers. One answer is this, that man's just another creature here on earth. Another one of the other creatures or animals, if you will, that are here on this planet, you know, grinding out life, maybe the highest form, because he can think rationally. In fact, most of the time he's able to think that way. But still just a part, they would say, of this cosmic machine hovering in space. And people look at life that way, this sort of existential way of looking at life. Shakespeare had this view. Listen to what Shakespeare says about mankind and life. He says, life is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. That's a pretty desperate mindset. No control, despair, no purpose. But David says this, Scripture declares this, verse 5, For you have made him, created by you, God, a little lower than the angels, and you crowned him with glory and honor. Not a tale of an idiot, not an accident. He's seen in Scripture as a, as a creation of God. Mankind is, man, woman, crowned with glory and honor. Scripture tells us also that we're made in the image of God. Made like Him. He goes on and says, in verse 6, You've made Him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You've put all things under His feet, all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the sea. 
Man is unique. Here's what David said. Listen, let me have your attention. Man is unique. He's created by God in the image of God. He has honor and glory, and, and, and he is uniquely designed. He has authority that God has given him. And as we move from the Old Testament to the New Testament, man is described as the temple of the Holy Spirit. God lives in him, and God lives through him. God speaks to him, and God speaks through him. We, we bear his image. God has designed vessels to live in and to live through. The Bible tells us in the Old Testament, God is, is, is like a potter, and we're like clay. And he shapes us and fashions us and forms us by, by his own hand and by the circumstances of life and all the things that he allows to come our way. And he, he pours into us his gifts. He pours into us his character. He, he, he turns us into that which he's created us to be. And whatever he chooses you to be, whatever he makes you by the potter with his hand and takes you as clay, he's the potter. You're the vessel. So if he makes you a teacher, teach. If he makes you an artist, create, paint, sculpt, design. If he makes you a builder, build. If he makes you a plumber, plumb. <laughs> right? Because he's the one who created you. And you do it unto him. Listen to this psalm. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. You, you've set the heavens. It's glorious. Out of the mouth of babes, even little children, the simple can see it and understand it and recognize that you're real. When I consider the heavens, the, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars which you have ordained, what am I, who am I, Lord, that you have even been mindful of me? And then he goes on to say this. You've made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You've put all things under his feet, sheep, oxen, even beasts of the field, birds of the air, fish of the sea, that pass through the paths of the sea. You say, John, stop right there. I don't have dominion over all these things. Beasts, fish of the sea. There's bears roaming Gulf Breeze. I can't even shoot it. The, 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 there's, there's sharks roaming the Gulf of Mexico. I don't have dominion over them. They can eat me. There's storms. Elsa's out there. There's earthquakes. There's viruses. I can't stop these things. What, what do you mean you've given man dominion over all these things? I can't stop these. It, it's not happening. Well... Let me take you to a passage of Scripture that helps us interpret Scripture. And you always want to interpret Scripture with Scripture. So if you have a Bible, flip over to the book of Hebrews, chapter 2, where we find this psalm quoted again. I've already seen it quoted by Jesus. Now it's quoted by the writer of Hebrews. It gives us a fuller view of this passage. In Hebrews chapter 2, beginning with verse 5, For he has not put the world to come which we speak in subjection to angels, but to one testified in a certain place. And here we have our psalm. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 6. What is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you take care of him. You've made him a little lower than the angels. You've crowned him with glory and honor. And set him over the works of your hands. You've put all things in subjection under his feet. Well, well Lord, not quite yet. Well, he goes on. For in that he put all in subjected under him. He left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not yet see all things put under him. But... We see Jesus. And here's what he's saying. Even though right now, quite, it's not quite everything's under our feet, we don't see our life experience like that, but we do see Jesus. 
And we know that man from the beginning of time, from the time of Adam, he disobeyed, he fell, the land was cursed, and we've been living in a fallen world since the time of Adam. We've been living in a time where uh, God's plan and purpose is being seen in a unique way since the fall. God's plan of salvation, God's plan of restoration, his concern for mankind. Every vessel that he shaped and every person that he has allowed to come into this earth, he desires to pour his presence into. And we see Jesus. We don't see all things under our feet. Sometimes we see thorns under our feet. Sometimes we see death and danger. But we do see Jesus, God's hope, God's plan. It's kind of like a a glimpse of what is to come as we see Jesus and his life and and what he was accomplishing and, 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 and all that is to come. I mean, think about the first miracle Jesus ever did. He took some water and all things were subject to him. He says, you got any water? Yeah, Lord, over in those purification jars, there's water. He says, well, bring it to me. And he turned it into wine. No grapes, no fermentation, no wine press, no toiling, no work. The simple elementary water was subject to him. And they began to pour the wine out, and everyone gasped and said, wow, this is the best wine we've ever tasted. Usually they they give the best first and the worst at last. A a storm comes on the sea. Jesus is in the boat. He's sleeping. The disciples are freaked out. We're going to die. Does he not care? And Jesus stands up. Because all things are under his feet, all things he has dominion over. And he says, peace, be still. The wind calms down. Elsa whimpers away. (laughs) And they're all just blown away. What manner of man is this that even the wind and the waves he has dominion over? He feeds 5,000, not out of generosity, but with, with a few loaves and few fishes. And we don't have dominion, but we do see Jesus. And I submit to you, we see a glimpse of what's to come. One day the lion will lay down with the lamb. You know, We may, in the millennial reign, have this kind of dominion. Right now, there's trials, there's difficulties, there's crazy stuff going on. But wouldn't it be great if if this this psalm, this passage here in Hebrews, comes true in our life one day in the millennial reign? You're you're, you're hanging out with some friends. You got any water? Hey, we got some water. Bring it over here. (laughs) Who wants a Butterfinger Blizzard? How about a smoothie? I mean, what, how amazing would that be? You know, right now we, we live in a difficult... You, some of you are saying, I'd take the wine. No, just, <laughs> just, just the butterfinger blizzard. <laughs> right now we, we live in difficult times in our world, in our culture. And what happened last year? I'm still trying to figure that out. You know, last year, you're, 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 you turn on your television or whatever, and you see these. I was watching uh, somewhere. I was out of town watching the, the, I believe it was one of the tennis matches. Might have been the one in France, and no one's in the, no one's in the stands. Umpires wearing masks. I turn on the TV now. The stadiums are just packed with people. What in the world is going on? We live in a crazy culture, viruses, suicide, confusion even about gender. What is is man? Yeah, what is he? Is he a woman? There's all this craziness. But the writer says, we see Jesus. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to know him, to be changed by him. And understand that God is real. This is is what David is saying. This is what the ancient psalmist is writing. 
Lord, how excellent is your name. Uh, we, all I have to do is look up in the heaven, and even the simple know it. That, that's what happens when Jesus comes riding into the city of Jerusalem. The simple people recognize the Messiah's here. They, they've embraced him, the, the religious, the, the wise, the, those who, who are the, 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 the scholars of that day. So that's a tale of an idiot. We know better. In the, in the book of Romans, as we're going through these crazy times of, of our culture and, and watching all the changes that are going on. In Romans chapter 8, listen to verse 18. It says, For I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For with earnest expectation, the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subject to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know... (coughs) that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs until now. Not only you and I, but all of creation is groaning, waiting to be under his feet, under God's plan, once and for all under his dominion, as described by David and described by the writers in, in Hebrews and here in Romans, and he goes on and says, not only that, but but we also, verse 23 of Romans chapter 8, had the first fruits of the Spirit. We've tasted it. We ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. I, I can say amen to that. For we were saved in this hope. But hope that is seen is not hope, for why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Waiting. We've had a glimpse. We see Jesus. And we'll be like him. And we'll have dominion. We've tasted of him. We, we've set inside, or we, we, we've set outside looking up at the skies, or that mountain vista, or that sunset. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, how excellent is your name. And inside, there's this, there's this uh, groaning, there, and there is this, this changing in us that's occurring. Though, though the outward body be perishing, the inward grows day by day. And our world is crazy. Politically, culturally, morally, philosophically. And here's what it does. It causes us to groan a little more, doesn't it? Oh, Lord, come on. Bring an end to this insanity. The increases we see all around our world in suicide rate is phenomenal. Drug addiction out of control. Overdoses all the time. Violence in our land, off the charts. Human predators and trafficking, who would have ever thought that it reached the place that it is? The moral collapse of America. People more concerned about all their rights than doing what is right. It's phenomenal to me. People are more concerned. Listen, I, I would submit to you that people are more concerned about their sod than they are their neighbor. I know that to be a fact. Don't take that too far. (laughs) God is going to fulfill his plan. And here's what he's doing in the midst of the chaos that we are all being impacted by. He's creating a deeper thirst, a deeper hunger for that which is to come. That's what he's doing. It's like, it's like if you have a special pie or, or cake or something that you really like, and, and you, know, you, you see someone preparing it. I, I used to really 
I love, you know, blueberry pies. My wife would make them once in a while, and you put them in the oven, and you watch the whole process. And it's like, wow. And finally, it slides itself into the oven. And you can smell it. You can smell it all over the house. <laughs> and you're waiting. And, and as you're waiting, it just creates a deeper hunger and a deeper thirst. You, you've got the ice cream waiting, the whipped cream. <laughs> you're, you're just ready. And this world is, is baking. It's, you, can, you can almost taste the fact that the Lord is coming. Going to fulfill his plan. He's going to bring dominion. And, and, and in, this, in this psalm that we're reading, as we look up into the heavens, it, he says, you know, the very last verse, O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. God, you speak to the simple. You speak through the simple, through the weak, and to the weak, to the humble. It's not complicated, Lord, to know who you are. It's not difficult to find you and know that you're concerned and invested in mankind. I just need to walk out at night and go, oh, Lord, how majestic is your name. And God has taken each of you and made you into his image, and he's crafted you, and he's, he's even before, uh, he, he knew you in the womb. And he has a purpose and gifts and challenges and a plan, and, and, and God so loved you this is a wonderful story. The Bible is a, is a love story of God saying, I so love you, I sent my only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him doesn't have to perish, but can have everlasting life. God, you're great. You're majestic. You, you can take a person who's completely lost and heading in a, in a total different destructive direction and turn them completely around and put them in their right mind. What is man that you should be mindful of us? And God says, I'll tell you what, it, what you are. You're my pearl of great price. You're the apple of my eye. I made you in my image. I so loved you, I sent my only son. And as the world has been shaken and brought to this place that it is right now and tested and I believe sifted, it's still easy to step outside on a clear night and look into the heavens, even with a simple mind, and recognize the majesty, the power, and the creativity of our God. Listen to, to Psalm chapter 8. L listen to it as it says, O Lord, our Lord, the Lord of all, how excellent is your name and all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes, the simple, the nursing infants, you have ordained strength because your enemies that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what am I that you're even mindful of me and the son of man that you should visit him? God will bring his plan to completion. He will make all things right. And it starts with making our relationship right with him. It starts with, and don't take this image too far, it starts with just lifting up and looking up and recognizing that there is a God and that he's mindful of you, that he hasn't forgotten you. It's not like, you know, like here's David, you know, out there, and he feels like I'm forgotten. All my brothers are being looked at by the prophet for great position, for great honor, and, and here I am. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, how great, how excellent you are, but what am I? And God says, David, you have no idea. I've got a plan for you. I've got a purpose for you. And I'll bring it to completion. And he's birthing, listen, deep inside as we watch what's going on in the world, a great hope, a great expectation. Don't allow yourself to grow defeated or come to a place where you think that God is not excellent, that he is not full of glory, and that he's not above the heavens. He is. And all things are being controlled and organized by him. David went through his difficult times. David went through his testing and through his sifting and had the weakness of flesh. 
but it didn't change who God was. It didn't change his excellency. It didn't change his glory. And, and, and as, he, as, he, as he pins this psalm, he reminds us and he calls us to remember the fact that God is a God of greatness, a God of glory, and that he does speak in all kinds of ways, not just through his word, but through, through the heavens, through creation, and that he's mindful of you and I, and he wants to make you and I mindful of him. So on this Independence Day that we celebrate as a nation, I want you to remember that you have independence in him. And as you look up into the heavens, and I know there's fireworks over in Pensacola, on the beach, in different places today, and, and, you'll, and you know, they have them everywhere. But look beyond that, to that which only he can do, and remember that we see Jesus. We see Jesus, and he's our great hope. He's our great expectation, and we celebrate him as we look up into the heavens every night and the independence and the freedom that we have because of him. He who has the Son and he who knows the Son is free indeed. Amen?